we spent some time together one evening and it was just totally normal a college atmosphere. You're gonna drink, you're gonna have something to smoke, you know, just totally relaxed. But then I remember something changed, like between one drink being handed to me or another, I felt I couldn't really control what was going on anymore. And the, all the lights were dimmed all of a sudden and I wasn't in possession of my actual body. Like I couldn't move or feel very much and I was scared. But I couldn't stop him and he just went right along with what he was expecting the evening to, you know, to end up like. And so I actually was just crying and uh, immobile. It took me for a long time to realize what happened that night because I remembered it with so much shame that I had, you know, I felt ashamed for drinking, I felt ashamed for smoking, I felt ashamed for spending so much time with that guy and shouldn't I have known that he was interested and shouldn't I have known things would go that direction and shouldn't I have, I just felt so much shame. And then of course I was felt ashamed for cheating on this boyfriend who was probably cheating on me too. I mean. I basically felt so much shame, though, um, that I didn't tell anybody or really look at it clearly because it was so filled with shame. But I did know something was especially wrong and hurtful about it, so I did, in my confused way, go and confess that. I confessed cheating on my boyfriend in the confessional because I felt that something was really bad here. But I didn't realize at the time that what was really bad here was that I had been, that I had been date raped. It's tough raising daughters today. Sure, my girls have opportunities that my mother and grandmother simply didn't have, and I'm very grateful for that. But overall, I feel like I spend way too much of my time trying to protect them from, and prepare them for, a culture that's quite toxic for women. I mean, have you seen the videos and Instagram posts and ads that young women are fed these days? It's craziness. The sexual objectification of women is by far my biggest concern as a dad. And it's not just the media. Do you know one of the main issues we face as parents in my community? Our daughters are having to deal with boys as young as 11 and 12 texting naked pictures to them and continually asking them to do the same. A new report highlights the intense pressure on young women to share nude photos of themselves. Researchers at Northwestern University analyzed nearly 500 stories on an anti-cyberbullying and sexting campaign's website. More than two-thirds of girls aged 12 through 18 said they had been asked for explicit images. Researchers say the girls faced persistent requests, anger, and threats from boys to send those pictures. And this is before they even get into college, where it seems like things get even worse. As if parents don't have enough on their minds sending their kids away to school, here's a stat that's gonna send a chill down your spine. Based on a recent study, a quarter of female college students say they were sexually assaulted. This is a frightening but very real part of the hookup culture. One stunning discovery in the report, misogyny and sexual harassment appear to be pervasive among young people. In this new report, 19% of freshman women at a large unnamed private university in upstate New York say they were the victims of rape or attempted rape during their first year at school. And that certainly doesn't end when women get out of university. How many of you have been sexually harassed over the course of your career? Leave your hand up if it's more than twice, more than three times, more than four times. That's what got me interested in the history of the sexual revolution to begin with, actually. I looked around and asked, how did we get here? I uh, am sometimes called the mother of the women's movement. My book, The Feminine Mystique, in 1963, broke through the image of women that was absolutely the only image of women in those years after World War II. The image Betty was reacting against was one of a supposedly blissful domestic suburban housewife. As technology advanced and the economy boomed in the 1940s and 50s, 
Women were told that they could find meaning and joy and happiness in all the modern conveniences of life, and that they could be perfectly content baking cookies and shuttling their kids to school. According to the magazines and television commercials, this was the American dream. Well, that dream didn't make Betty content. And after conducting a survey of some of her Smith College classmates, she was convinced that millions of other women were asking the same question she was. Betty Friedan called this the problem that has no name. And she believed the solution was to be found in professional career work. She was convinced that women could be fulfilled and content and happy if they could just get out of their humdrum homes and away from menial tasks such as laundry and changing diapers into the supposedly exciting jobs that men were doing. Friedan had grown up in an unhappy family in which her father had forced her mother to leave her career and stay at home. Although she was still working as a writer, Betty herself had given up becoming a psychologist for her husband. She was sure that if those career ambitions were unfettered by domestic duties and spousal expectations, the problem that had no name would be solved. The Feminine Mystique was a huge hit, but it wasn't the only sexual revolution book making big waves in the early 60s. There was another woman author who also believed that contentment and happiness in life was to be found somewhere other than where Better Homes and Gardens was claiming. Long before Sex in the City's Carrie Bradshaw, Helen Gurley Brown wrote Sex and the Single Girl, the year 1962, a bestseller with a radical message at the time. Young women should enjoy work and sex. Sex and the Single Girl sold two million copies in the first three weeks after its release and was quickly made into a movie starring Natalie Wood and Tony Curtis. In it, Helen Gurley Brown taught single women many of the same lessons that Betty Friedan was teaching married women. Domestic life was not all it's cracked up to be, and working hard in a career would lead to happiness. But Brown added one more element to the mix, unmarried, promiscuous sex. She's quoted as saying, good girls go to heaven, bad girls go everywhere else, and humorously credited with separating more young women from their virginity than anyone else in the world. Sex is one of the three best things there are, in my opinion. I don't know what are the other two. Like Friedan, Helen Gurley Brown was preaching a salvation message to women who had a problem they couldn't quite put their finger on. And when she became the editor at Cosmopolitan, that became the Bible of her crusade. The gist of Cosmo was hard work and sex without the kids will set you free. Formerly a literary publication, Brown turned it into a sex manual for young women, and it quickly became one of the world's best-selling magazines. Interestingly, Betty Friedan was not a big fan of Helen Gurley Brown. Betty Friedan called Cosmo quite obscene and quite horrible. However, when it came to one piece of technology, they were completely unified, the birth control pill. Now at first, this seemed like just a side note to me. But as I dug deeper into this topic, I realized that the pill was absolutely essential to achieving their respective goals. Does the sexual revolution happen without the pill? Like Abs how, how important is the pill to the Absolutely pill? not. It's absolutely crucial. I mean, contraception was the fuel that made the sexual revolution run. You take birth control out of the equation and the sexual revolution cannot get out of first gear. The birth control pill had been approved by the FDA in 1957, not as a contraceptive, but as an aid to menstrual disorders. However, stopping pregnancy was a well-known side effect, and soon more women than ever were mysteriously developing a need to have their cycles regulated by the drug. In 1960, it was officially approved as a contraceptive, and by 1962, 1 1.2 million women were taking it. By 1963, that number had ballooned to 2.3 million. For Ferdinand and Brown, the timing was perfect. After all, if you were going to preach that freedom and fulfillment could be found in money and careers and promiscuous sex, you had to have some way to overcome the pregnancy problem. Women were being fired for being pregnant. I was fired for being pregnant in 1969. Corporate America didn't want all of these pregnant women around in their offices. But if you could say, it's okay, boys, she's going to be on the pill, then they'll say, oh, okay, well, then she can be just like a man, and I guess we can hire her. This is why the National Organization for Women, which Friedan founded in 1966, made sure that access to contraception was included as part of its Women's Bill of Rights in 1968. 
can't be liberated sexually and not have the pill. You don't get very far. As for Helen Gurley Brown, it's no surprise that someone who called for women to have sex outside of marriage as often as possible would need easily accessible contraception to make that vision a reality. That's why she put a puff piece about the pill on the top of the cover of her very first issue of Cosmo, and why positive articles about the pill have been a staple at Cosmopolitan for the last 50 years. The pill finally uh, made good on the great promise of separating sex in terms of sexual pleasure from all of its natural consequences. This promise had actually been made most vocally in the 20th century by a woman who came before Ferdinand and Brown, the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger. In their embrace of the pill, Betty Friedan and Helen Gurley Brown were joining a battle that had only recently won big victories, thanks in large part to Sanger's tireless efforts. In many ways, Sanger was a combination of Friedan and Brown. She had seen her mother die young after having 11 children, and was convinced that contraception would set women free from the drudgery and pain of domestic life. But she was also a big believer in promiscuous sex. You know, she cheated on her husband continually and didn't think anything of it at all. She had this wacko notion that uh, evolutionarily speaking, you had these uh, sex juices in your body that if you released them all the time, it actually caused the genius somehow to effuse from your pores and transform you. Well, you know, you read it now and you think, oh my gosh, you know, the crystals would be more scientific than this, you know, palm reading or anything. But she really believed that. And of course, apparently, given how much time she spent bed hopping, she must have considered herself a, a genius of high regard. So contraception brought Sanger, Brown, and Ferdan together to achieve a common goal, the unshackling of women from motherhood and domestic life. It also brought them together against a common enemy. Today, your opposition stems mainly from where? From what source? Well, I think that the opposition uh, is mainly from the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. At this point, the Catholic Church was basically the only institution speaking out against contraception. But, as I was surprised to learn, it hadn't always stood alone. Up until the first half of the 20th century, Every Christian denomination across the board recognized the immorality of contraception. It wasn't until 1930 that the Anglican Church was the first to open the door to contraception, breaking an uninterrupted tradition for 1,930 years. All the reformers from Luther to Calvin and beyond recognized the serious immorality of rendering sexual intercourse sterile. And finally, the Anglican bishops buckled. Every 10 years they have this Lambeth Conference and they, they were fully in agreement with the Catholic Church until that August of 1930 when, for the first time, a little crack appeared in the Christian dam. And within 10 years, all mainline Protestantism had collapsed as well. The Catholic Church was the only one that did not go back on this historical Christian teaching. However, it wasn't just a Christian teaching. It was actually predicted in 1930 by wise men and women around the globe, not only by Christians and certainly not only by Catholics, that if contraception becomes the order of the day, we will end up redefining marriage altogether and society itself will dramatically change. Sigmund Freud, of all people, who we know was no friend of religion, said this. He said, the abandonment of the reproductive function is the common feature of all perversions. Likewise, Mahatma Gandhi also saw in as early as the 30s that birth control made beasts out of men, that it, it better enabled men to use women for their own lustful purposes. Theodore Roosevelt condemned contraception as, quote, the one sin for which the penalty is national death. T.S. Eliot, the celebrated writer, described contraception as an experiment upon civilization that was bound to fail. But by the mid-1960s, most dissent had vanished, and there was some anticipation that even the Catholic Church was going to adjust with the times. There had been a commission that had been set up by Pope John XXIII uh, to look into the question of contraception right around 1960. There was no sense that the Church was going to reconsider its teaching on contraception. It was how would it present this teaching in a very different world. But when he died and Vatican II started, Pope Paul VI decided to greatly expand that commission. And somewhere along the line, in the course of that commission meeting, they decided they would change their mandate 
and they would take up the question whether the church could and should change its teaching. Some of the deliberations of this commission ended up being leaked to the press. And by the time it was announced that the Pope would release a document concerning the morality of contraception in 1968, it was assumed by many that he was going to approve it. Everybody was so excited about something that would um, control overpopulation, help women be more active in the world, help people control their family size. They thought, wow, we found the magic, the magic potion right here, it's the contraceptive pill. But Paul VI came through very prayerful reflection, through all the evidence was a very agonizing time for him. He issued Humanae Vitae and said what had been the constant teaching of the church, that God loves babies, sex and babies go together. Is it okay to mess with that? Is it okay to, to break that connection? Well, Paul VI said, uh, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, no, it's not. Let's just say it was not well received. The dissent just blew up. Major Catholic publications, major secular publications, Time Magazine, all these New York Times, huge headlines. Humana Vitae, as a, an expression of church teaching goes, is the most derided, mocked, ignored, unread thing that ever existed. People may not have been reading Humanae Vitae, but they were reading Cosmopolitan, which was filled with thrilling stories about the happiness that the sexual revolution was bringing women. Unfortunately, those stories weren't true. Now, when I was at the University of Missouri School of Journalism, we could choose a magazine to study, and I had chosen Cosmopolitan. Reading these articles in Cosmo, I said, these are too pat. These, these stories are made up. And when I got to Cosmo and got on staff, I found out they were. <laughs> so they were too, they were too clean, they even were at too the time. Perfect, yeah. Too perfect. Helen Gurley Brown had written a little handout on writing things, and she even had guidelines on how to make, it, make up an expert. It's much easier than actually going out and finding some expert who's quotable. And I remember one time making up uh, an expert, and I just called him a Los Angeles psychologist. <laughs> but, but I mean, I'm laughing about it now, but of course it was, it was a very serious thing. These young women believed these stories, and they were just sex fantasies, and we began, they began to live them. That yeah, was give the me an example of the type of well, story you would Well, the, this kind of story that, you, you know, this woman is, she uh, goes to Paris, she meets a man on the Champs-Élysées, she helps him order a pastrami sandwich at a Jewish deli. They go back to the hotel on the left bank, they fall into bed uh, laughing, and the next morning she knows she's in love. Well, that woman, that woman didn't actually exist. We presented these stories like women were having these wonderful lives. And don't think about it, you know, you're out there in Michigan, you've got three kids, the, the, you know, the baby just threw up on your shoulder. And this just sounds so wonderful that these women are living these exciting lives. And women divorce their husbands over these things. Fueled by this media campaign, the sexual revolution picked up steam. And it certainly did result in more women attending college and making money. In the early 1960s, just 7% of women completed four-year degrees, and less than 10% of students in medical and law schools were women. Today, more than one in three get four-year degrees, and women make up more than half of college students in the country. They also earn half of all law degrees and half of all medical degrees. However, this doesn't seem to have had the effect that was intended. The feminist movement in this country promised women once that they could have it all, a successful career, financial success, and a family. But now, a controversial new study by the University of Pennsylvania suggests that women are less happy than men, despite all of the progress that women have made since the 1970s. We're back on this Monday with today's woman and some upsetting statistics when it comes to us ladies and our happiness. Yes, according to one government study, women are less happy than they were 40 years ago. Despite a movement that brought so much progress to American women, their happiness has dropped relative to men over the last three decades. You know, I'm actually quite surprised by this report because opportunities, career opportunities are, are very extensive and I, I actually don't know why that would turn up and I think why is the actual critical issue in this whole Point, if you're coming up with a result that surprising. Uh, it's uh, absolutely surprising and uh, we're gonna, we'll, we'll find out why, by golly. <laughs> the American
American Psychological Association has released the results from its annual Stress in America survey. So here's who's the most stressed out in America, women, women and millennials. Bloomberg created a profile of the most stressed out person in America. She's a woman in her late 20s or early 30s, taking her young son to school on the bus. After she drops him off, she might sneak a quick cigarette before heading to a job that pays less than $50,000 a year. Just another young parent trying to juggle work and family, money and bills. Even millennials without kids are stressed, though. A record number of them may have college degrees, but this has come at the cost of huge student loan debt and a bloated job market. That's one reason a record number of millennials are living back with their parents. Speaking of parents of millennials, having their grown-up kids at home is only one of many issues causing them stress. According to the Gallup Healthways Wellbeing Index, middle-aged American women have the lowest well-being of any age group or sex, and this is why. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Come on. Debbie gets up with the what? sun. Her no kids go. still live at home. She works a full-time job. Hi, Mom. Takes her lunch break to visit her mom, who recently suffered a stroke, and is trying yeah, to balance her marriage, so all while you. attempting to stay healthy. Okay. Yeah, those days, I want to find a corner and, you know, curl myself up and get away from everybody and everything. But the stress of trying to have it all wasn't the only negative consequence of the sexual revolution. It also had a very distinct effect on relationships and family life. Interestingly, many of these developments had been explicitly foreseen by Pope Paul VI and others. It was predicted, in fact, that we will see an increase in adultery, an increase in premarital sex, an increase in divorce, an increase in fatherless children, and that would lead to an increase in crime, drugs, poverty, so many of the social ills we're experiencing today that we just kind of take for granted as part of the world. Now hold on, can all of that be traced back to contraception? Well, it's more complex than this, but let me show you the inner logic, and the inner logic is really undeniable. Human beings are often tempted to do things we shouldn't do. This is part of our fallen nature, right? We need deterrence. For example, what would happen to crime rates in your community if there were no such thing as jail terms? Well, they would go up. Apply that same logic to our sexual behavior. The temptation to commit adultery has always been there. Adultery is nothing new. But take away the main deterrent from committing adultery, which is the fear of an unwanted pregnancy, and what's going to happen to rates of adultery in a given society? They're going to go up. What's one of the main causes of divorce? Adultery. The sexual revolution certainly did lead to an increased divorce rate. But for decades, the message has been that this really isn't a bad thing because women are better off and kids are resilient. Dr. Jennifer Roback Morris runs an organization called the Ruth Institute, which is dedicated to helping victims of the sexual revolution. According to her, divorce has actually been a disaster and women and children have been particularly hard hit. My husband and I uh, experienced four and a half year infertility crisis, and we resolved that crisis by adopting a little boy from a Romanian orphanage. He arrived in April, two and a half years old, and then our daughter was born six months later. But those two kids showed us very clearly, very clearly, children need their parents, and children are not potted plants that you can put on a shelf and water them once in a while and they'll be fine. That is just not true. So much goes on in the first 18 months of a child's life. And we saw that with our little boy by what he had missed and how difficult it was to make up all the things that he had missed. Um, he's doing fine now, thanks be to God. Uh, but, but it was scary. It was a very scary time. But that's what convinced me that children need their parents. And you will never talk me out of that. I don't care what slick ad campaign anybody comes up with or what kind of propaganda comes down the pike saying that kids are resilient. Ugh. Kids are not that resilient. Kids need their own parents. And so that was the turning point for me. Layla Miller started chronicling the effects of divorce almost by accident. She noticed some sadness in one of her friends that seemed to be related to her parents' divorce, and she was curious about it. So she put out a questionnaire on Facebook asking for feedback from now adult children of divorce. I got, probably in the first two days, I got about 100 people. I got what I consider to be an avalanche of pain. You can't even imagine what the children of divorce go through. They all had so many of these issues, and they 
can point to, especially now as adults, because maybe at the time they didn't even understand, why am I full of such self-loathing? Why am I so insecure? Why am I looking for love in all the wrong places? Why am I acting out violently? And then they realize as they grow up, my whole identity, even who I am, even who I, everything I knew about my life was blown apart. I had no say in it whatsoever. And I was expected to go along with it and think it's good. And no one, not even counselors, no one asked me about how I felt about it or, or whether, um, whether I had some thoughts that weren't so pleasant about what's just happened to my life. Here's one I hear all the time. Your parents get divorced, then they get remarried. So you're going from one house to the other. But your remarried parent over there, they have a child together. And that child doesn't have to go anyplace. That child gets to be with their mom and dad all the time. But you are going back and forth from mom and dad. And when you go to the, your dad's house, there are pictures of dad and his wife and their children and their whole extended family on both sides. All of that's on the wall. But there are no pictures of you with you and your mom and dad or your mom's side of the family. None of that is over there. It's like half of your family doesn't exist half of the time. So having two half homes is not the same as having one home. Themes of isolation, themes of abandonment. A lot of these people go on to their own marriages in stark terror of either being abandoned or abandoning and leaving their own marriage because they never had a model of how to stay. And so you get some of the participants who are explaining how they would plan, even though they had a wonderful spouse, but they would plan for that day that either they would have to leave or that the spouse would up and run, and yet there was nothing wrong with their marriage. It never, ever ends for the children of divorce. It shows up at holidays. It shows up at weddings. It shows up at graduations. Who's supposed to have the seat of honor? Is the new wife really going to come? Do we have to put up with the stepdad? It goes on and on and on. The idea that kids get over it, it's just, it's just not true. It wasn't until one of their parents actually physically died where they felt, it's over. And this could be decades, decades after the divorce. And others said, almost identically, some of them, when their one parent would die, and then they said, oh, I guess my parents aren't getting back together. The message that the kids get is that love can stop, that love, even though it was supposed to go on forever, ends when you're not happy anymore with the person. So that sets them up for a life of thinking, okay, I'm only lovable until I'm not, you know, and then what happens? Kids aren't the only ones adversely affected by divorce. Women suffer as well. Studies show that women who have been divorced have much higher financial, emotional, and psychological stress than their married counterparts. Part of this is simply the extra workload they take on. A new report today confirmed what millions of us already know, that the powerhouse driving so many families are moms who work outside the home. They're the primary breadwinners in a whopping 40% of families, nearly four times the number in 1960. And of those women, 63% are single mothers with a median income of only $23,000. There are 10 million single mother-led families in the U.S., which is triple the number in 1960. If it were not that divorce touched on sex, as Peter Kraft has said, it would not be allowed in this society, something that is that detrimental to the foundations of society. And yet because it's about sex, because marriage is about sex, divorce is about sex, we allow it. We allow it and we affirm it. What happens in a given culture when there are huge increases in adultery, huge increases in premarital sex, and these men and women have already determined by the choice of using contraception that they don't want this act to result in a child, but then the contraception fails. We know there's no 100% effective method of contraception. So we're gonna have huge increases in so-called unwanted pregnancies. What's the next demand? What happens next? There's a demand for abortion as a way to back up failed contraception. It's not surprising that Betty Friedan founded the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws in 1969, and Margaret Sanger's Planned Parenthood 
became the country's leading advocate and provider of the procedure. The Supreme Court actually acknowledged this in its 1992 case, Planned Parenthood versus Casey. It said for many years now, people have been making decisions that define themselves and their place in society based on the availability of abortion in the event that contraception should fail. I read in the Guttmacher Institute, Planned Parenthood's research arm, this, this is coming from Planned Parenthood, I found this amazing stat that a woman taking a contraceptive with a 98% effectiveness rate has a 70% chance of experiencing an unexpected pregnancy if she uses that contraceptive method over 10 years. And this is what, what I saw as a young woman. I saw so many women who were college-educated, intelligent, responsible young women. They were following everything society told them to do. They were being responsible sexually. And then something goes wrong, something didn't work out. They end up with a positive pregnancy test and they felt like they had no choice. I have known many women who ended up in abortion clinics. Not one of them ever felt like she really had a choice. Once the feminists started pushing for abortion and contraception, I just naturally thought those were good for women. So I got pregnant the third time by surprise. I had been so unhappy on that pill that I didn't want to go back on it. But we, we had two children, we just had a second, and we, we didn't have a lot of money. So I went back to a doctor and I said, I don't like this pill, it makes me depressed. He says, oh, aren't things going wrong in your life? It can't be the pill. And so he gave me the prescription. I was so mad at him, but I took the uh, prescription and walked out the door. But he didn't bother to tell me that you have to take that pill up for a month before it's effective. And I started, and I, I was pregnant within a month on that pill again. And so this time, we were in a panic because we didn't have much money. Our books were not selling that well. We had two children. And at this time point, uh, we decided we had to have an abortion. And that was the worst decision of our lives. What's sort of crazy about this is that while the push to get a career and have sex without babies causes women to struggle mightily to keep their fertility in check, while they advance in their professional lives? The exact inverse problem arises after they have reached a certain age and decide that now is the time to have children. Dr. Morse categorizes this group of people as heartbroken career women. I came up with that terminology because that was my story. Um, the reason my husband and I had an infertility crisis is because we waited until I was 35 to even think about having children, right? Uh, and why did we do that? Well, we did that because my career came first and my education and so on and so forth. Um, so I'm very sensitive about this, and I, I did a little bit of calculation. I mean, once again, this is something where we don't, nobody asks the right questions. But I estimate that there are probably 500,000 women in the United States with advanced degrees who have some kind of impaired fertility. What's really notable is that the number of IVF babies mm -hmm. is going up and the number of babies being born in general is going down. Do we think this is because people are waiting later? Do we think this is because people are having a tougher time giving or con conceiving au naturel? Uh -huh. What do we think? You know what, no one knows for sure, but the waiting longer for giving birth is probably the best bet. It's very strange. You sever sexuality from procreation. And what happened was that we're having sexuality through any means for any end and procreation by any means for any end. What was more strange than people throwing away children at the same time they're frantically trying to have them by any unnatural means? The result is that 40% of women in America, nearing the end of their childbearing years, say they have less kids than they would have preferred. The reason it's so insidious is that we've been sold the idea that in order to participate in the economy, you must follow the same path that the men have followed. So what we did is we took the higher education system, we took the economy as given, and we've asked women to adapt their bodies to the economy and the university life. And I say that what we need to do is to take women's bodies as given and make the economy and the university adapt to us. Although the university has not changed in the way that Dr. Morse would like, it certainly is different today because of the sexual revolution. Indeed, 
It can be argued that campus culture is the section of society in which the combined ideals of Betty Friedan and Helen Gurley Brown are on clearest display. Here, casual sexual encounters have become the primary currency of social interaction. These relationships have two main characteristics. They become sexual very quickly, often before the partners even know each other at all, and they don't require commitment or develop into anything deep and long-lasting. Sociologist Mark Regnerus calls this cheap sex and argues that both of these developments are a direct result of white acceptance of contraception. It slowed relationships down, men were unwilling to commit, women felt pressure to have sex before they might prefer to in a relationship. So she got to control her fertility. He got charge of the pace with which relationships became sexual. One reason that there isn't supposed to be a commitment is that both partners, but especially the girls, are supposed to be focused on getting a career and establishing themselves financially, and relationships get in the way of that. Unfortunately, cheap sex doesn't actually feel cheap to young women. She had agreed to be friends with benefits with a guy uh, on campus, and you know, she thought at the beginning of that that she could do this, that she could be friends with this guy, sleep with him when they felt like it, and have no emotional attachment to him, have no emotional uh, repercussions. And she was confiding in me that that didn't turn out to be true. Uh, it was very difficult. She found herself wanting to be loved by him, wanting to be pursued by him. And he wasn't going to do it because the agreement was, we use each other, uh, you know, mutually beneficial use, and then we move on when we don't want to do that anymore. And she realized pretty quickly that that wasn't wasn't good for her. During those years, what shaped my idea of the male-female like sexual interaction was just like men have these desires, whether or not they tell you they won't act on them ahead, ahead of time, they will act on them. And then you go along with it to not be awkward. It's not so much that women have taken control and can be the aggressor and the mm -hmm. powerful. It's like no. that's actually not the case in the hookup culture. No, I, I feel like it was, it's sometimes played that way, it was played a lot, that way a lot in the media that I saw, like in Sex in the City, like the women are in control and they're getting what they want. Maybe some women, you know, are experiencing different things than I did, but I definitely didn't have that experience myself and um, I, I didn't, I felt like it was always the male, the male pleasure was the goal. <sighs> Hookup culture, female pleasure, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Like that didn't happened so much for me. So the morning after, are there any girls on college campuses looking back at the night before saying that was awesome? Or no, was no, I didn't experience that. Instead, it was often jokes about that was really awkward or, oh my gosh, you won't believe what happened. Those kind of jokes. Um, or you come up with nicknames for the guys, which sounds really silly and demeaning, but I think it was our way of, our way of um, making light of just what we were doing. I had an interesting moment where I, I was sitting on my bed reading this On Human Life encyclical and I had some women's magazines spread out in front of me and I realized that every single one had the word sexy somewhere on the cover, sometimes more than once. <laughs> All of these articles were how, how to please men sexually, how to be sexy. The women were dressed, you know, unbelievably scantily clad, you know, showing off everything and I thought, this isn't how my grandmother's dressed. This isn't how my great-grandmother's dressed. This is not how women have ever been encouraged to dress in human history. And I had always bought into these ideas that, oh, that's because women were repressed and, you know, that's, it, it was an anti-woman thing that women didn't used to, you know, let it all hang out. And then I thought, you know, as a woman, I don't think I want to be told that wearing micro mini shorts in a, in a tube top is like how I should be dressing. Like, I wish the standard of style was frankly a little more forgiving. I thought this is actually very anti-woman, this, this new image of women where we all have to have perfect bodies with not a flaw on them and wear these fashions where everything is just hanging out all the time. And I thought, when did this style of dress change? When did it go from women dressing in a, a fashionable but dignified manner 
to having to look like stripper Barbie all the time. And I realized it was right around when our society accepted artificial contraception. And, and in Humana Vitae, Pope Paul VI predicted back in the 60s, he said, if we accept artificial contraception, men will start to look at women as objects. Women will start to feel pressure to make themselves objects for men. And I looked from that encyclical to the magazines on my bed, and I realized it happened. He was right. Contraception has readjusted the relationship between men and women forever. It's a complete game changer. The man can use the woman as a sexual object. The woman, thanks to contraception, becomes a masturbation device. And we see this working itself out in the mainstreamization of pornography. When Humana Vitae was, was released and rejected in 1968, within 12 months, you had pubic hair in Playboy magazine for the first time. Then you had the rise of other more, more gnarly, more uh, hardcore magazines. The Hustler penthouse was the next generation. And then with the invention of the modem, you have internet pornography, which is, I mean, you can, you can access the most horrifying illegal content with a click of a mouse. All of it was enabled by this fundamental refusal to, to organically unite children with sexual experience. Pornography has become so pervasive and is so clearly harmful that governments around the world are starting to call it a public health crisis. And it's not just the objectification of women directly that is a concern. Porn also hurts women by being a major cause of divorce. Indeed, 56% of divorce cases involve one of the parties having an obsessive interest in pornographic websites, and a full 68% involve one party meeting a new romantic interest over the internet. Porn is also a major reason why there are fewer marriable men to begin with. People are turning into, quite literally, zombies. We're worried about zombies coming from some weird, you know, virus that aliens give us, and it's like, there's men walking around bleary-eyed. There's there not much left of them but a right arm and, and, and eyes and internet connections. And what else do you need for a zombie? They're dysfunctional. They're not able to do anything. They're non-males. They're almost non-humans. And while making men into zombies, we've gotten rid of women altogether. Think what has actually happened. The pill has made women obsolete. It disassociates sexual pleasure with marriage and procreation, and it's, it's just unleashed wherever I can find pleasure. Well, pretty soon, it doesn't have to be with a woman. I had a professor who put it this way, and it really hit me between the eyes. He said, as soon as you sever orgasm from procreation, any orifice will do. In other words, any means to the sexual pleasure will do. So women are now without men because the men prefer the pornography. And now they're taking up with the ultimate objectification of women, literally making an object of women called a sex bot. The move from contraceptive sex to robotic sex and pornography is a very easy move once people see what's going on. So we're better off. This is the great society. This is the pleasure utopia you promised. My father left when I was two, and then growing up, I got very attached to my grandfather. And he ended up um, divorcing my grandmother and leaving her for another woman. So it, when that happened, it destroyed me. And I was really young. And because of that, I just learned, well, love doesn't last. It's a temporary thing. So when I got to high school, it just kind of rolled over into my relationships. And I had my first serious relationship at about uh, 15. And after a while, it was just wonderful. And I thought I was in love and everything was great. And then slowly we got very physical and I ended up losing my virginity. And, and it literally just all went downhill from there. And I got into the partying, I got into the drinking, I got into the cl clubbing, you name it. I was into it and in the end, you're just left empty and broken and damaged from the world. And after the world says, oh, it's not that bad. My friends used to tell me, oh, it's not that bad. It's not that big of a deal. And there's one morning where I woke up just feeling disgusting from the night before. And I just remember my friends that echo of, well, it's not that bad. 
and it's not that big of a deal. Just thinking, what's not that big of a deal? My body, my self-respect, my dignity, but I was so far gone. How do you even recover from that? When a person is being used, they know it. They know it in the depths of their being. They may deny it, they ignore it, and, and I tried, but I knew it. And after a while, you realize a person's not spending time with you anymore. They're just spending time with your body. And there I was, a healthy 16-year-old, taking birth control and popping pills and taking Depo-Provera shots so I wouldn't get pregnant all the while so I could just be used by people. It just, it just didn't make sense to me. One night my mother came to me because she just didn't know what to do. And she said, you're going to a chastity talk today. I said, no, I'm not, thank you. She said, no, you're going. I told her, I'm not going to go listen to some dork talk about sex. Thanks, but no thanks, it's not happening. And I thought, oh, I'm going to lose my car. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll go. Let me, let me just go to her talk. And um, I'll sit in the back for 15 minutes, and I'm out of there. And I went, and I stood in the back of the church. And the 15 minutes that I thought I was going to sit there, God literally changed my life. That speaker was sharing insights based on the teachings of Karol Wojtyla, the man from Poland who became Pope in 1978 and took the name John Paul II. I look at the teachings of Pope John Paul II and the theology of the body and how it impacted my life. And it just showed me my dignity, my value, my worth, what I was created for, my sexuality was created for. It just, it opened up a whole new world. It is a world that John Paul II had been exploring for decades and which was very close to his heart. For the first five years of his pontificate, he delivered about 130 Wednesday audiences, which have now been come to known as the Theology of the Body. We identify Theology of the Body by St. John Paul the Great with his Wednesday talks from 1979 to 1984. But the foundation was laid 20 years before that in 1960 with the release of uh, then Cardinal Vortiwa's book, Love and Responsibility, which came out providentially the same year that the first birth control pill called Anavid was approved by the FDA. Literally at the same time that this pornography and birth control pill were coming through, uh, the church was looking honestly to find a way to proclaim to this culture what is good, what is true, and what is beautiful. And one particular bishop in Krakow, Poland, found his own way. In that book, Love and Responsibility, which is uh, it's a difficult read, it's very dense, very, very rich and very deep, he was saying things that no Catholic prelate ever said. Things like, uh, the importance of husbands giving their wives orgasms. It was a rare find, whether among a clergy or a rare find even one in the Catholic world that spoke so deeply and eloquently about the meaning of love. And that became a powerful antidote to the sexual revolution. St. John Paul II and I are very tight. <laughs> <laughs> I love JP too, so much. Uh, in fact, when I wrote my first sex essay for the Tampa Bay Times, I interviewed a couple that couple told me, you need to read Love and Responsibility, which was written by JP2 before he was Pope. And I had never heard of it, and I was like, you know what, I'll look it up. So I looked it up, and I ordered it, and it came in the mail. And when I opened it, the first chapter is on the verb to use, and I read about a page, and I was like, absolutely not. And I, I put it back on the shelf because I was like, there's no way I'm going to get through this. It took me three years to read that book and comprehend it. I would pick it up every now and then, give it another try. It was just too heavy, too philosophical. My brain wasn't ready for it, so I put it back. But that third year that I had that book, I picked it up and I must have read it in about a month. I finished it on the 4th of July. I will never forget. And that's when I had this whole new depth, this whole new understanding of the depth of chastity, this whole new understanding of what love really is. It was an understanding that John Paul II had developed over many years of ministering to young adults before he became Pope. John Paul II, when he would teach the university students in Poland, the, the, the women in the class would be like, well, surely he must have been married or at least engaged. Like, how could he know us so well? Well, he knew them well because he listened well. There was a woman who was a, a human rights activist who suffered greatly under communism, and I believe also Nazism. And uh, she really struggled with understanding faith in God and, and wrestled because of a lot of that suffering. And her friend was able to arrange an opportunity for her to have a private meeting with Pope John Paul II. And they sat down for a long time together. And then this woman came out of the meeting in tears uh, of just joy. And the woman said, well, what did he say to you? And, and she said, he's the most extraordinary man I have ever met. And they said, well, she said, well, why? She said, he listened to me. 
And that was the genius of John Paul II. He knew that what we had to say was more important than what he had to say. And he really felt that way. And so you have this man who spent years listening with not just his ears, but his heart, camping with young people on these trips, young married couples. And they say of the 50 to 60 uh, young engaged married couples that would go on this can these canoeing trips with him in Poland, there was a divorce rate of 0%. None of them got divorced. And when you learn what it is that he was teaching them in the wilderness, then it becomes obvious why. One of the main points of John Paul II's teaching was that women were getting a raw deal from the sexual revolution. There was one instance where John Paul II was addressing a number of bishops. And after this meeting out of the bishops, one of them, Bishop Darcy of Indiana, came to him and said, Holy Father, there's one word that struck me during your address is attractive. Like, how do we make these difficult moral teachings attractive to the modern world? And he said, John Paul became very serious, like a philosopher, and gave a response that Bishop Darcy said is forever embedded in his heart. He said, John Paul said to him, it is necessary to understand the soul of the woman. He said, all of these things that have promised to liberate her, premarital sex, contraception, and abortion, have they not enslaved her? But that one power-packed little sentence, if you want to understand this whole issue, you first have to understand the soul of the woman. And if you don't get that, you're not going to get the rest of it. Somewhat paradoxically, in understanding the soul of a woman, John Paul II started by affirming the beauty and dignity of the woman's body. What I love about it is that it's counterintuitive. You think, well, if there's an emphasis on the body as evil or sexual excesses, the solution you'd think would be to focus on the soul and spirituality and prayer. It's not what John Paul II did. He focused on the body and the goodness of the body and the body as an integral part of who we are, not an instrument, not an, an external you know, kind of widget that I use at my will, but I am a body and I am a soul. And so it's that integration that powers the message of the theology of the body. It was this love of the body that led John Paul II to take the loincloths off the nudes in the Sistine Chapel. Yeah, when Michelangelo originally painted the Sistine Chapel, people got pretty upset about it in the Vatican, saying, you know, this, this is like a stew of nudes. This belongs in a, in a tavern or a brothel, not a papal chapel, all this nakedness. And so as soon as Michelangelo died, because he wouldn't do it in his life, they had many of them painted over. They chiseled out St. Blaise, his whole head, out of it, and changed the direction of it so he would be looking away from St. Catherine of Alexandria, who was nude. And so they had all these renovations, and John Paul II said, no, 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 no. Purity is not about spending the rest of your life avoiding the sight of the human body. Purity is about seeing the glory of God in and through the human body. And so he ordered these restoration artists to go through and peel away the years of the soot and the grime and to be able to take off many of these loincloths and restore it to its glory. And in many senses, that's what he did to the church's teachings on sexuality that many of them had been encrusted under these countless misunderstandings and, and just a confused notion of what the church really taught. And he kind of peeled that away so we could see God's original design for human sexuality and all its beauty and all of its glory. That for me has been the real issue this issue of what does it mean to honor the dignity of a woman. You know, if I were to say to a woman, I'll only have sex with you if you get a nose job. Uh, I'll only have sex with you if you, you know, get breast implants. Uh, am I loving her? Or am I treating her as some object for my pleasure? Is it any different if I say, I'll only have sex with you if you sterilize your womb? Fertility is integral to who we are as human beings. I can't say to a woman, I love you, but I don't love your fertility, because fertility is integral to who she is. And it amounts to something like this in the relationship. The man and the woman saying to each other, I really want to have sex with you. Oh, I mean, not the real you, you know, the altered manipulated you, you on the pill, you wearing a condom, you this, you that, and it's not the real you. A few years back, I gave a seminar on a Catholic vision of sex and marriage. After the seminar, I had a woman come up to me and say, I, I agree with most of what you're saying, except for the part where you said contraception is evil. And she went on to explain, she said, you see, I have a friend, and for her, contraception saved her marriage. And then she went on to tell me this story. This friend of hers had uh, a few children, and her husband came and said, 
look, we've had enough children, and unless you get on the pill, I'm going to have to find someone else. Because the husband literally said to her, I'll replace you unless you agree to contracept. The woman initially didn't want to contracept because she was a Catholic and wanted to be faithful. But she thought it was better to contracept than to be replaced by another woman and have her husband leave her. And the woman then went on to explain that, you see, she saved her marriage by satisfying her husband's desire to use contraception, and now they're very happy, they don't fight over this issue anymore. What's interesting, if you look at this from the perspective of John Paul II's uh, theology of the body, the whole point would be is that the man did replace the woman with an altered, manipulated version of herself. And the woman allowed herself to be replaced, replaced her true self with her contracepted self, and gave in to her husband's desires precisely to relate to someone other than her as she truly is. So it's interesting to note that all the early feminists of the 1800s recognized contraception would degrade woman, would lessen her in the eyes of men. Somewhere along the line, and I believe Margaret Sanger is probably largely to blame here, women bought into an idea that rendering their bodies sterile was essential to be liberated. And liberation in this sense means to become the kind of being that can have sex without getting pregnant. What kind of being is that? That's called a man. A man is the kind of being who can have sex without getting pregnant. A woman is the kind of being who can have sex and get pregnant. Is this a bad thing that needs to be erased? Or is this a good thing that needs to be honored and respected? If a woman, to claim equal dignity to a man, has to make herself more and more like a man to claim that equality, then isn't she already buying into the fundamental lie that she's not equal in dignity as a woman? I think a lot of people who attack the church's teaching on contraception never really pause to ask themselves a really important question, which is, what if the woman's body is already perfectly made? What if fertility is a gift and that she doesn't need pills and drugs and shots and implants and latex? What if the woman really needs is to be understood? And that instead of suppressing her, her fertility and her body with these synthetic sex hormones to conform to our desires, why don't we conform our desires to the perfect way her body has already been created? And isn't this authentic sexual liberation? John Paul II also talks a lot about the language of sex. He notes that the body and the way we use it sends particular messages to others. The sexual act has a meaning. It's what one person is saying with his or her body to another person. And what John Paul II says, what the language of the body says, is that I'm willing to be a parent with you, right? I've chosen you out of all the people that I was attracted to, and that's usually a lot, but you're the one I want to be a parent with. I want my whole life bound up with you, right? That's what children do. They make your life completely bound up with another person's life. And so it's not just I find you attractive. It's not just I expect to enjoy a great physical pleasure with you. It's that I think you have what it takes or can get what it takes to be a parent. I think you're generous, I think you're kind, I think you're responsible, I think you'll make a great father or great mother. I want to bring more little yous into this world. What a thing to say to another person. On the other hand, contraceptive sex says something very different. Look what contraception has done here. 50 years ago, if a guy said to a girl, I want to have sex with you, she could rightly conclude 50 years ago, this guy wants to marry me and father my children and build a life with me. What does it mean today? It means you're hot and I want an orgasm from you. Which one is more honoring of who and what a woman is and what a man is? You know, the, the church is not saying that you're going too far. You know, oh, you went all the way. No, that's not the problem. The church is the one saying, hey, we want you to go all the way. We want you to go not too far, but beyond that, make a total gift of yourself is not a, a one night stand or a hookup or friends with benefits. This isn't a total gift of self. It's a lie in the language of the body because your body is saying, I am completely yours, when in reality, no total gift of the person has taken place.
The idea that there should be a gift of the total person comes from John Paul II's definition of love. A lot of people think love is strictly a feeling. In the thought of, of Bishop Wojtyla, he recognized love as self-gift. Love is about willing the good of the other person. It's about making sure uh, that this person's needs are met. It's about laying down your life for this person. We're actually wanting to do what's best for the other. And when you explain this, people like, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I know that that ache of being alone and that that ache of dissatisfaction when I've settled for something less than love. So the opposite of that then is not so much hate as we usually think of it as an emotion. What's the opposite of love? Then? So if love is this self-gift, willing the good, and trusting ourselves to the other, he posited that if it's in the will, then the opposite is to use one another. So instead of willing the good for the other, we appropriate, we take from the other for ourselves, and we don't entrust ourselves to the other, but we separate and protect ourselves from the other. So this use and protect is really the opposite of love, which is self-gift and entrusting ourselves to. For John Paul II, contraception is wrong then because it kills love. Contraception changes the very nature of the sexual act from loving a person to using a person. Now, sexual pleasure is a great gift from God, and we need to rejoice in that gift properly understood and lived. But as soon as you remove fertility from the sexual equation, the goal is no longer starting a family. The goal is no longer serving the next generation. The goal is pleasure. And when pleasure is the goal, what do other human beings become? They become means for our pleasure. It's fascinating to me that that we have convinced is not one but two, maybe even three generations of women now, that our fertility is is our enemy, that our children are our enemy, that there's something that need to be taken out, and they get in our way, and they are not going to help advance us. And I think this is really the source of so much unhappiness in our culture. This triumph of the contraceptive mentality has changed everything about our view of children. It's almost like we're living in a, as someone once said, a post-apocalyptic wasteland where infertility is the goal. Much of this comes back to these these twin goals of feminism, which is that we we want to work, we want to make our own money, and we don't want any obstacles to that. And secondly, we want to be empowered in our sex lives, and、uh, we don't want obstacles there either. Look at the language of contraception. We use a verb to describe our behavior when we use birth control, and the word is protect. If it's really cold in northern Alberta, I need to protect myself from the frigid air. I, I wear a parka or I stay indoors. If I'm at war, I need the protection from the enemy with a bulletproof vest or a tank or whatever. But what am I protecting myself against when I use contraception? A baby, the coming to be of a new human person. We should not be using the language of protection to surround and and to infiltrate what is supposed to be the ultimate experience of safety and security and peace and communion. So the sexual revolution has caused the death of love between the sexes, and the death of love between mother and child. This development has been particularly devastating to women. Who, according to John Paul II, have a unique capacity for life-nurturing love. He called this the feminine genius. By tamping down and denying this aspect of femininity, women have left themselves grasping for purpose. We find ourselves when we give ourselves away, and I, I think this is one of the keys that, that we're missing. We're looking for ourselves all over the world, you know, from Paris to Bali, and we're not finding ourselves because, of course, it's all this matter of giving ourselves away. The most common response to this is, of course, what are you saying? Women need to be stuck at home? That they can't have a career? That's the interesting thing: is the pendulum. People think you're either saying women have to be astronauts and firefighters, or they need to be doormats. And I think actually, I think we're getting the point in, the, in, in our the generations where people are getting tired of this. Like, okay, we know women can be astronauts. We know women have these gifts. We know we have all these abilities. 
can we please get back to the things that are going to be really stirring our hearts? And there was an article a few months ago, women that were very professional, they were making a lot of money, they had great jobs. But at the end of the day, they said, you know, I just want to go home and grow a garden. I want to quit my job in Bahrain and I want to go have a family. I want to go bake bread. And, um, you know, this was my experience. I, one of the things that I wanted to do more than anything was to make cookies on Saturday with my niece and nephew. And, you know, of course, they lived across the country and I couldn't do that. But it was just this simple desire that I think that we have for doing something more with ourselves. Yes, we've gained great opportunities, but that's not really where our hearts are. By her very nature and being a woman, God has called all women to motherhood. And it doesn't necessarily mean biological motherhood. It could be spiritual motherhood or emotional motherhood in different ways, but it's a gift that's distinct to the female sex. I think women have this capacity to nurture. This is the kind of woman that when you leave her presence, you know yourself better. You know something about yourself that you didn't know before. And you feel like more of yourself or more of a person. There's something healing and life-giving about it. John Paul II did not think that motherhood necessarily means having biological children. But that doesn't mean that he believed women should avoid having kids. And that is because parenthood is one of the primary ways in which both women and men learn to love at the deepest level. I remember the first time I held Naomi, my oldest daughter, and she's screaming. And I said, Naomi, Naomi, it's okay. Daddy's here. Daddy's here. And I don't know what I'm saying. I'm crying and I'm talking. And when I start talking, she did one of those and looked at me. And she looked right at me. I don't even know if she could see me or not. It didn't matter. She looked right at me like, I know that voice. And yeah, we're talking to the, in the belly all those months and whatnot. But when she responded like that, something kicked in me. And I, I, wanted to, I wanted to tell the world, I wanted to profess to her and everyone, I will die for you. I, I will live for you. And, and I hate to compare, because, you know, to compare is to despair. But, you know, it took a while to get that with Melanie, my wife, right? I, praise God, I'm, I'm there. I will live for her. I will die for her. But it took a while. This was within seconds of this little baby looking me in the eye. And it was just this instant sense, you can trust me, is what I felt. You can trust, I entrust yourself to me. I will will your good. And yeah, it's hard. It's unbelievably hard. And it's hard because it, even with each child, it unravels, it makes bare my own sin. The more they annoy us, the more they bother us, the more they just get under our skin, is a bigger light bulb that says, oh, there's something that hasn't been worked out. There's a way that I can learn now to see my own weakness and defect and to make sure it doesn't pass to another generation. I had my first child when I was 35. I thought, you know, this, these, are, these first two months, these are hard, but it's going to get better. And it did a little bit, but there was still huge transitions. I remember even just thinking about going into the store. I have to carry, take this child with me all the time. And it was just, I was used to traveling the world. I lived in France, I lived in Poland, I lived in Italy, and, and you know, suddenly my life is just turned upside down. But the bigger thing was that I thought, you know, every week I had this sense like, okay, next week's going to get easier. It's going to get, it's going to be better next week. And then finally it dawned on me like, wow, what if it's not supposed to get easier? What if there's some real gifts in this difficulty that I'm not even paying attention to because I'm so focused on when will this get easier? And as soon as I kind of had this insight, like, motherhood is supposed to help take me out of myself and help make me more selfless. Then all of a sudden, motherhood had this whole new cast, and I sort of understood the things that were happening interiorly to my own soul. You know, I was becoming less self-absorbed, and I was becoming a lot more patient, a lot more compassion, um, you know, all of those kinds of things. And I think the place where this was most striking to me in my life was air travel. I used to fly a lot, and I, you know, I always had great seating and very well taken care of because I had so many points and um, so when I had my children you know I'd been several years all those points were gone you know I had no status and you know, I was so excited to just be on a plane and not have anybody bother me but I didn't care I was in the back of the plane and sort of you know in a corner by myself like it didn't matter that I wasn't uh, in business class anymore you know it was just and, but prior to that, I would have been, I think I would probably was a terrible flyer and I would have been really upset and cranky about being put in the back of it. So 
you know, it was just a small marker of, of where my patients and, and what kind of a person I was being transformed into by um, that experience of just being grateful for everything and, and having a sense of gratitude instead of, um, you know, that awful fire that nobody wants to deal with <laughs> at the front <laughs> counter. <laughs> So take a married couple. They've come to the conclusion, their eyes have been opened, that contraception is damaging to their relationship. Does this mean they just have to have 15 kids? The Catholic Church has never taught that couples are obligated to have as many children as is physically possible. Never was the teaching of the church, never will be the teaching of the church. But here's the question. What could a couple do if they have a good reason to be avoiding a child, maybe a financial reason, maybe a health reason, uh, maybe they have several kids that are young and they just need a break, right? I can relate. Uh, what could they do to avoid a child that would not violate the dignity of their sexual union? Chances are everybody watching this is doing it right now. What could they do? They could abstain from sex. There is nothing wrong with abstaining from sex. We do it all the time. Every married couple knows that abstaining from sex can be a profound act of love. And oftentimes, very often in married life, love demands abstinence. And if you can't abstain, your love is called into question. You might want to make love, uh, but you're at the in-laws and there are thin walls. If you can't abstain in this situation, your love is called into question. You might want to make love, but one of you is sick. You might want to make love, but it's after childbirth. You might want to make love, but you're in a public place. If you can't abstain in these situations, your love is called into question. And you might want to make love, but you have a serious reason to avoid a child. If you can't abstain in this situation, isn't your love called into question? Does this mean you have to abstain until you hit menopause? Well, let's look at that. A couple past childbearing years know that if they engage in intercourse, it's not gonna result in a child. Are they contracepting? Not at all, they're accepting the way their bodies are made, the way the Creator made them. Well, guess what? A woman is naturally infertile for about two-thirds out of every month during her fertile years. With modern methods of natural family planning, not to be confused with the old-fashioned rhythm method, we can know with 98 to 99% accuracy when we're fertile and when we're infertile as a married couple. Armed with that information, it's the fertile time. You have a serious reason to avoid a child. What should you do? The loving thing is to abstain. It's another part of the month. You're infertile. Is there any reason you have to abstain now? I don't know. Are you in a public place? Are you at the in-laws with thin walls? Or is one of you sick? If not, if all systems are go, rejoice. Come together. This is the way God made them. One of the, the transformational uh, realities for Melanie and me when we first got married was introduction to what's called natural family planning. And we were grew up Catholic and been around, thought we'd been around circles. We'd never even heard of this before. So literally we're on our engaged encounter weekend, sitting on the floor, you know, one of these evenings and this, this couple, this is not a cliche, they, they rolled in with the little three series BMW, jumped out of the car into the retreat center, gave like a 12 minute talk on NFP, natural family planning, blah, blah, blah. And Melanie and I, we both got graduate degrees. We're Catholic. We're looking at them like, what the heck are they talking about? I mean, they were given this, this enthusiastic, this has changed our marriage, you know, 98% uh, effective and put this and blah, blah, blah. And we're looking at them like, we should find out more about that. Every other couple in the, in the, the room there was like, that was a waste of time. All right. But Melanie and I went up and we, we signed our names to find out more information. Because you know what it was? It was them. There was something about them that was attractive. We weren't sold from hearing it the first time. We, we looked at them, we're like, Whatever they got, you know, we want that. That was the truth. That changed our life. What I found about using natural family planning instead of artificial contraception for child spacing is it's really more of an alternative lifestyle <laughs> than, than an alternative to contraception. It, it is completely effective. There are these wonderful modern methods that have sometimes an even higher effectiveness rate. But it's a mistake to see it as an alternative to that because it requires that you approach human sexuality from an entirely different perspective. 
It is a sacrifice-based method of child spacing. You don't get to do whatever you want, you know, whenever you want. And that is the big difference between natural family planning and contraception. With natural family planning, we're talking about abstaining from intercourse during the woman's fertile period. It amounts to waiting for each other. But in contraception, there is already a statement there, although we could wait, we're not going to wait. And it comes across simply as this. Sex with you is good, but not worth waiting for. You're not worth waiting for. You see, my love for you doesn't inspire self-control in me. You don't inspire self-control in me. You see, this is the point of contraception. Love is patient, but I'm not. See, the problem is that we have been trained as a culture, particularly since the advent of the birth control pill, to look at love through the lens of sex. And it's almost like looking at a binoculars the wrong way. We're really called to understand sex through the lens of love. Right? That sex is a particular expression of love, not the false idea that you get love through sex. Basically, the only warnings we were ever given, I think, um, for casual sex was just make sure you're wearing protection, make sure you're on the pill, make sure so you don't get pregnant. That's that. That's all. That's the only kind of warnings I ever heard. And of course, no one would ever suggest, because it's assumed you're just going to participate in this culture, no one would ever suggest if you really, you know, don't, you know, if you just maybe don't, maybe just don't have sex with people. Like, no, no one would ever suggest that. So it was just like, okay, well, just wear protection. And the truth was, though, like afterwards, after all those years of participating in that culture, I felt that protection didn't protect me from much. It didn't even make me feel protected at the time. I felt very vulnerable and very hurt. I felt very afraid of getting pregnant despite all that protection. It didn't protect me from my mental pain. It didn't protect me from the heartache. Where did I finally find a, a vision of sexuality that actually seemed beautiful to me? It wasn't what I had participated in. It was, ultimately, I learned it through um, the Catholic Church teachings, which later after college, I had that roommate who a uh, convert roommate who was on fire to tell me about Catholic Church teachings on sexuality. And she had also um, had a challenging couple years prior to that and heartache for similar background. It's a little different, but anyway, she had uh, told me all about theology of the body and John Paul II teaches this. And I thought, she's a, a little kooky. But at the same time, it was, she was a really good friend. She was a really sweet girl and it just, um, she made, it made me think about things I hadn't thought about before. And then once that, once I read more about it, or I just went to events where people talked about it and I learned more about it, I went to a Christopher West conference and I just, it was very compelling once I absorbed it. And I thought, screw whatever I was doing before. I want, I want to be in this, in a, you know, relationship where someone values me, values my, entire being, not just my body, but my, you know, my heart and my soul. And, and I also don't want to be in any of those pressure scenarios again. And I just feel like so much of it was. And that's where John Paul II is just so amazing when he wrote about it. And it was such an appreciation for, for women, I felt. And I liked how he put it. He said, the opposite of love is not hate, it's to use someone. It's not just, I hate you. It's someone just gonna use you and dispose of you and don't even care about you. And that's what I had experienced over and over. And at that point, I didn't want any more to do with that. It became like an allergic, like, I don't want, I don't want to be anywhere near that. That makes me want to throw up. I want something better than that. We know 50 years after Humanae Vitae better than we ever knew at Humanae Vitae. We've been living in you know, contraceptive hothouse. The experiment's been done. You could think at the time, it was possible to think in, what, 1960, 1968, that contraception was gonna make things better. It's not possible to think that now. It's impossible for anybody who has eyes to see to think that contraception has, has been uh, an overall benefit for men, for women, for children, for a culture. I am done with all that I've called love 
won't go back. My heart is all torn up, but you've been here, fixing me with needle and thread. Mm, please take my shame for holding.